Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tamiko Brown Nagan, Dean of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program titled The Stories We Tell and the Objects We Keep Asian American Women and the Archives. I'm thrilled that we're finally able to gather for this important program, albeit virtually, and I'd like to begin by expressing my gratitude to everyone who made this event possible, especially the members of the planning committee and to all our distinguished speakers. I'm also grateful to Professor Jane Kamensky, the Forsheimer Foundation Director of Radcliffe Schlesinger Library, Ken V. Phillips, Curator for Race and Ethnicity at the Schlesinger, Rebecca Wasserman, Executive Director of Academic Ventures and Engagement, Jessica Vicklin, Director of Events, and to their outstanding teams, thank you. Finally, I want to thank members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and all our annual donors whose support keeps Radcliffe programming free and open to the public. This afternoon, we set out to explore issues that go to the heart of the Radcliffe Institute's mission and to the legacy of Radcliffe College founded to make Harvard accessible to students and scholars who were then excluded from this university. We're dedicated to excellence, opportunity, and inclusion. And today's conference advances this commitment by exploring ways to reimagine and preserve the stories of Asian American women. Discourse on race in the United States is frequently predicated on a black white racial binary that can conceal the breadth and depth of the American experience of race. That's why opportunities like this one for a more inclusive discussion are so important. We also have a second objective in mind today. The project of telling a more complete history is integral to the work of the Radcliffe Institute. Radcliffe Sessinger Library is the preeminent archive on the history of women in America. But the materials housed in the Schlesinger do not yet support the telling of the history of American women in its richness. To begin to remedy this, in recent years, we've committed to diversifying our collections. The Asian American Women's Advisory Group that seeded the idea for today's conference is a key part of that effort. Working together, we seek to ensure that the archives reflect the full variety and the depth of American women's lived experiences, including not only the experiences of women in positions of power, but also those of women who didn't or don't consider themselves history makers and who may not realize the importance of preserving their stories. Far too often, the history of we the people has been narrowly focused on a privileged and powerful few. By foregrounding women and gender, and by documenting diverse experiences across race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, and political ideology, we can tell a far richer and more accurate history of the United States. And this is vital to the broader work of securing equity and opportunity for all. Over the course of our program today, we'll be joined by distinguished Asian American scholars, activists, and creative artists. These speakers will share with us stories of their own families' lives in the United States, stories of other families and communities, and the objects behind those stories. Through these examples, we will see firsthand the power of archival materials, objects, written records, photographs, and more to complicate historical narratives. It's an opportunity to celebrate the strides we've made but also to recognize the important work that remains to be done. Thank you again for being here. And now I'd like to turn things over to Genevieve Clutario, the Andrew W. Mellon Assistant Professor of American Studies at Wellesley College. Welcome Genevieve, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I wanna thank the hard Harvard Radcliffe Institute for this opportunity to share and tell the stories and histories of Asian American women. And I wanna start with an object from my own family collections, a photograph my mother shared with me uh, a few years ago. So in this image, there are three people at a hospital in Los Angeles, California, decades ago. 
The woman on the left is Dr. Sakai Shigigawa. The woman on the right is my mother, Feli. And the wailing, angry, red-faced newborn infant is, can you guess, me. So I'm going to use this found object as a guide to help ground us in the rich, ever-changing, and growing field of Asian American women's history. While it's impossible to truly give a complete overview of the far ranging complex and deep histories of Asian American women, what I can do today is give us a sense of the scope, the contours and the shifts in Asian American women's history and scholarship. So the term Asian American is a constructed pan-ethnic term that emerged out of the political and social movements of the 1960s and 1970s. And Asian American was coined to forge political links between heterogeneous individuals and communities in order to create solidarities against institutional racism. Asian American studies as a field of research also stemmed from these movements and scholars began studying and writing on Asian American women as an answer to the call for more scholarship and histories. They were driven by political necessity. They were driven by the need to document marginalized and unrecognized histories. Earlier works in Asian American women's history made critical interventions in the writing of US history written not as additive or derivative stories, these works were central to the experience of Asian American women. Um, they centralized their experiences to give us the much needed vantage of what Erica Lee calls the gendered roots and routes of US history. So what emerged were histories of how the first federal immigration restriction policy, the PAGE Act, targeted Chinese women specifically, um, and other examples such as, and as the, as the field grew, so, so did the work on the contradictions of citizenship and belonging, as well as discourses of freedom and rights, as is the case of Japanese incarceration during World War II. Here's where I turn to the photograph again. So um, I stumbled upon my doctor, my mother's OBGYN, and also our family doctor, Dr. Dr. Shigigawa's story in Val Valerie Matsumoto's book, City Girls, a book that I was excited to teach in the first Asian American studies class that I taught, um, actually here at Harvard. So it was jarring and moving to learn about the woman who was our family doctor, a woman who my mom always encouraged me to look at as a role model. And I learned through this book that Dr. Shigigawa was born in 1913 to a Japanese gardener and a picture bride in South Pasadena, California. And it was during the outbreak of World War II that Dr. Shigigawa was a medical resident at the Los Angeles County Hospital. However, with the signing of Executive uh, Order 9066, she, like so many other Japanese Americans, was dismissed from her position. Dr. Shigigawa and her family were then incarcerated at the Santa Anita racetrack that had been transform transformed temporarily into a sorting center. There, she treated patients and was able to avoid incarceration at the Heart Mountain Camp by accepting an opportunity to continue her residency in Chicago. It was in 1948 that Dr. Shigigawa finally returned to Los Angeles and sought to establish a new private medical practice. And there Shigigawa faced uh, racist housing covenant laws, which her neighbors used to try to oust her and her family. Over the course of time, the racial and ethnic demographics of Los Angeles changed and the majority of her patients were immigrants and people of color, many of whom were turned away from other practices and hospitals, a symptom of inequality, systemic racism and anti-immigrant ideologies. By the year 2000, Dr. Shigigawa estimated that she had delivered between 20,000 and 30,000 babies. And I was, as you can see, uh, one of those babies. So the photo shows two women whose Asian American stories are quite different. My mother came to the United States in 1980. She left the Philippines in the midst of a brutal dictatorship and a, that was under martial law. 
she was able to enter the United States on a work visa that was a product of an ongoing colonial relationship between the Philippines and the United States, which influenced the making of the Philippines into what Robin Rodriguez calls the labor broker state. My mother describes Dr. Shigigawa um, as she was recounting to me um, the story behind this photo. She described to me Dr. Shigigawa as a mentor and a friend who soothed her loneliness and longing for family and assuaged her fears around childbirth and parenthood. I highlight my mother's story and her appearance in this photograph to also mark a shift in the field of Asian American women's history. From its inception, Philippine American studies had necessarily grappled with histories of empire and its influence in the global circuits by which Filipinos navigate. But it was in the early 2000s that we began to see the larger field of Asian American studies take a transnational framework more seriously. In this turn, the transnational identifies movements of people, ideas, things, and capital across and between borders. And as a result, new topics and histories have emerged. But at the same time, the topics that have long been at the heart of Asian American studies started being analyzed in new and exciting ways. So for example, the immigration narratives like that of my mother began to take into account not only the policies that allowed her to enter the United States, but also the global forces that would have influenced her movement in the first place. In turn, it is Asian American women's lives that gives us new understandings of larger historical forces. Asian American women's history uncovered overlooked vantage points concerning immigration, policies on housing and land, community formation. Their stories show us the impact of colonialism and empire on constructing labor pipelines that targeted women. These structural forces would shape all forms of labor from the care work to healthcare and to medicine. And these histories I suspect will help us to further comprehend the toll of the current global pandemic of COVID-19. We have seen the numbers that convey the disproportionate and terrifying numbers of Filipina, Filipina nurses who have died of COVID, for example. The transnational framework in Asian American women's histories also provide insight into the many layers of activist work and that didn't just happen in terms of public facing labor. Lily Kim tells us of the work of Korean American anti-colonial activist women who fundraised by cooking, baking and selling goods, who went door to door to gain support. Such labor may appear unglamorous, but was continuous to be necessary um, work that serves as the backbone of communities. Asian American woman also reveals the long reaching impact of wars and militarization. They force us to reckon with the consequences of gendered and sexual violence in World War II and the Cold War and call for us to see women as witnesses who tes whose testimonies give us knowledge and truth. They tell us about military brides and transnational adoptions that arose as consequences of militarization. Southeast Asian American women's stories and memories gives us a better understanding of refugee experiences and asylum seeking and how the realities of war and refugee experiences continue to shape the livelihood and lives of Southeast Asian Americans for many generations. The works on Asian American women and critical refugee studies teach us how to grapple with the notions of displacement and the persistence of war memories. The field of Asian American women's history is rich and it continues to change and grow. And the work of the symposium stresses the importance of pres uh, preserv preserving histories, telling stories and gestures towards new directions and possibilities. I see this symposium and my own work as answering the call of the late Dr. Don Mabalin. She told us, it's our story and it demands our love and attention and respect and we, ne we need to tell the story. The stories we tell and the objects we find 
are evidence of life and living. And today we answer the call to continue to uncover, preserve, and tell the stories of Asian American women. It is now my pleasure to introduce a video by Julie Chung, a 2020 Harvard graduate who will offer a student perspective on our themes. In this unpublished work called Peace Builders, Julie asks how Asian American women are often expected to keep the peace, have built their own meanings of peace in the US and across the Pacific Ocean. Her medita meditations on the Pacific waters connect her family home in South Bay, Los Angeles to South Korea, where she is today. Once Julie has concluded, we will move directly into our first panel, Reimagining Our Stories, which will be moderated by Jian Kim, Professor of English at Harvard University. Julia, the virtual floor is yours. My name is Julie Sun Young Tung, and today I'll be reading aloud a piece I wrote called Peace Builders. San Pedro, California, 1943. Yuri Kochiyama and her family are sent to an internment camp in Jerome, Arkansas for two years under President Roosevelt's Executive Order 9066. San Pedro, California, 2020. I visit White Point Nature Preserve. There is a plaque at the trail entrance that commemorates the area's large Japanese population who were forcibly removed during World War II. Hikers tug along their dog's leashes to get to the trail's ocean views. I'm the only one who stops to read. Seoul, South Korea and San Pedro, California, 1976. U.S. backed dictator Park jung hee donates the Korean Friendship Bell to the people of Los Angeles to celebrate the bicentennial of the U.S., honor veterans of the Korean War, and to consolidate traditional friendship between the two countries. On one face of the bell, a goddess of liberty holds a torch besides a Korean spirit, appearing as a woman in a hanbok who holds a dove of peace. San Pedro, California, 2020. I visit the Korean Friendship Bell, now a popular spot for Instagram photo shoots and family gatherings. Wine bottles weigh down visitors' picnic blankets from parachuting into the sea breeze. Tourists watch the sunset bleed into the Pacific. I try to imagine the path carved by U.S. Army ships sailing to war. Fifteen minutes away from San Pedro, California, 2020. I am home with my family, grappling with my role as a peacekeeper, a mediator, a good daughter, and a child of immigrants. The Korean-American women I knew as a child faced two choices. Do you keep or do you disrupt the peace? In the face of injustice, they heard advice like, she shouldn't have said that. He can't help it, he's a man. You make it worse by reacting. Just leave things alone, will you please? And so they subdued, they swallowed, and they suppressed. I was socialized to believe that I am a peacekeeper, and peacekeepers do not make a scene. They mediate, but never escalate, resolve, but never react. They exist to subdue, to swallow, and to suppress. I'm sorry to disturb you, I used to say before anything unpleasant, as if I am the reason why you may feel guilty or unsettled. But that is an illusion of peace an appearance of still water that has been forced to deep freeze, that is a mirage of calm in the vast ocean space, asking us to contain our movements, our power, our waves, that is a delusion of peace that asks us to silence, conceal, and stifle, so that you may carry on without carrying the damage you cause us. You freeze the ocean's waves so you're safe on the shore above us. So I am not sorry to disturb your peaceful hike when I tell you that the U.S. uprooted thousands of Japanese Americans during World War II and sent them to concentration camps on the suspicion of U.S. disloyalty. So I am not sorry to disturb your peaceful picnic when I tell you that the U.S. backed brutal right-wing military dictators in Korea and has over 180 military bases across the Pacific today. So I am not sorry to disturb your fragile illusion of peace when I finally give you a peace, a peace of my mind. I no longer want to please or appease just to maybe get a piece of your pie. You say I am disturbing the peace, but I can't disturb what was never alive. 
There is no peace when we must subdue, swallow, and suppress. There is no peace when there is no justice. No justice, no peace. Together we shout out loud at Black Lives Matter rallies and with protesting crowds. Asian American women are not just here to please. We are here to fight for justice and to build towards peace. We are peace builders and troublemakers. We are here to be seen. I am not sorry to disturb your peace because you have disturbed our own for too long. So when Yuri Kochiyama built transnational movements for freedom and women crossed the Korean DMZ to demand U.S. imperialism's retreat, they built a peace by undoing the ocean's deep freeze. I dream of a peace where the waves dance freely and our feet feel the movement of the water, splashing, crashing, and soaring in the sea breeze. Thank you so much for that powerful presentation, Julie. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Chuyun Kim, and I'll be moderating the first panel, Reimagining Our Stories. I'll be introducing our three speakers and then offering just a few thoughts about the kinds of questions and ideas that you'll see running through their various presentations. So our first speaker is Taz Ahmed, an activist, storyteller, and poet who is the co-host of the Good Muslim, Bad Muslim podcast. She will be followed by novelist Gina Apostol, the writer of Insurrecto, which was published in 2018, and The Revolution According to Raimundo Mata, which just came out. Uh, so congratulations, Gina. And finally, our third speaker is Hong On Chung, a photographer and sound video and performance artist who is also an associate professor of art and art history at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Organized around the idea of reimagining our stories, this panel explores questions of how to tell stories that exceed trouble and perhaps transform the kinds of stories that have already been told about Asian America, the Asian diaspora, and Asian American women in particular. We're immediately confronted with the question of what counts as our stories when those stories are necessarily mediated by a range of historical, social, and cultural factors, including transnational migration, stereotypes, as well as tropes about race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexuality, class, and established genres and conventions of cultural expression. Um, but that's a lot of academic talk. To put it another way, we always come into our story late. After the set has been built, the audience has been prepped, and the actors have been cast and have already started memorizing their lines. But what if we don't like what we see? You'll hear in these presentations how these three artists have worked through an often violent and dehumanizing archive as a way both to acknowledge its power and to challenge it. And I should note that some of um, what you'll see will be very disturbing. Um, you'll see how they've experimented with putting different genres and media in conversation with one another as a way to unsettle our relationships to objects, sounds, and images, and thus to get us to experience and understand familiar stories differently. And finally, I hope you'll come away with an appreciation for how each of them asks us to think critically and imaginatively about the limits we might draw around what we believe is our story and our history. Um, and so with that, I'm very happy at this moment uh, to turn the virtual floor over to um, Taz Ahmed. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm already so emotional watching everyone speak. It's so uh, wonderful to be in this space. Um, we're a year into this pandemic, so this also feels very helpful to talk to people. So I'm gonna um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my trajectory as a Muslim American politico and artist, and in the end, I'll talk about some of the things I've made. Um, I I grew up in the '80s, so I grew up with these images of what it means to be brown and Muslim in this country. Um, at the time, I thought this was kind of exciting. I was like, oh, brown representation, but I had no idea that this was brown face and this was uh, exotification and this was, you know, things that weren't good. But in the at the time, just being having a, having representation meant something. Um, this is my family, the, the my Families from Bangladesh. Um, I put this in there because I saw uh, Genevieve's mom's picture and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna keep this in my presentation. That's my mom in the middle. My mom is a driving force of a lot of the reasons why I got my start in doing political organizing. Um, the origin story that I, that I talk about often is about September 11th, I was in DC. I had just moved to DC, I was 21. 
And I got a call on the phone from my mom. And she said that the FBI had come to our house and she had let the FBI into the house and uh, they were interrogating all Muslim people at the time in 2001. And I had told her, you know, now, I mean, like now we know, don't, don't let the FBI into your house. And in that conversation, my mom said, it doesn't matter uh, how long I've been in this country, I'll always be a second class citizen. So that's been kind of that guiding light that's really driven a lot of the work that I've done, both as an activist and as an um, art maker. I started an organization in 2004. This was the first major presidential election after the 2001 uh, uh, event. Um, and I started an organization organizing South Asian Americans uh, out to vote. One of the things that I did was I took all the voting activism skills that I had learned over the years and just applied it to being South Asian. This was the first time this had ever been done. Um, one of the things I learned doing this process was that, you know, people don't talk about talk to brown people about politics. They don't talk to Asian Americans about politics. I, I did a lot of organizing with both South Asian and um, Asian Americans in that election cycle. And this really got me thinking about what does it mean to um, include our communities in the civic engagement conversation, one that we're often excluded out of. I was also writing on this blog at the time uh, called Sepia Mutiny. It was a South Asian American blog. It was a group blog with a bunch of other brown kids. And our, our uh, mission, I guess, was just to write something that was happening in society that was South Asian American related. And this process was really fascinating to me because uh, I wasn't seeing our stories being told anywhere else. We were um, excluded from the mainstream narrative. Uh, there wasn't like a site where you could go to to learn uh, everything that was happening. And as I you know, moved forward with my education, I learned that what we were actually doing was telling uh, the counter narrative of the community. And that really motivated me and uh, was a grounding force, realizing that all the activism that I was doing, all the storytelling that I was doing was re related to this, um, uh, what critical race theorists were doing and uh, was related to uh, telling the counter narratives of our community and how important that was. Um, I started doing a lot of digging into our South Asian American history. I'd come from an uh, immigrant. My dad immigrated here in 1969. So when he immigrated, th there was not this idea that our history went a lot further than that. Um, the middle picture here, this is a uh, uh, cover from the Bellingham race riots that happened in 1907, where um, South Asians who were working in the paper mill up in uh, Bellingham um, were driven out of town by white supremacists. And when I started thinking about how here in here in the now that we're experiencing all these hate crimes against South Asian Americans, especially um, after the 2016 election cycle, that there was actually a hundred year history of this happening that really reframed a lot of my thinking around um, how we how we talk about uh, anti-Asian hate crimes. I'm also here in Los Angeles and I was, I've been doing a lot of work with the local Japanese American community. So on the left, you'll see an image of Manzanar on the right. Um, you'll see an image that we see often of the Bangladesh, Bangladesh liberation uh, movement that was happening in 1971. And, and I, I think one of the things that I wanted to bring up in showing this image is how history is connected to each other. That my history of having um, a mom who had to leave with everything that she could carry in her backpack from uh, when they had to escape from West Pakistan to now Bangladesh was so similar to my friends who have family members who had to escape with everything they could on their, in their bags to go to concentration camps. And I think these kinds of histories are, um, they're not just transnational, but they're transhistorical where they're connected over, um, over time and space. And um, we need to make those connections to do solidarity organizing, which is what we've been doing a lot of down here. And then of course, these are more contemporary images of protests that are happening. And I think one of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about is how are we, um, 
as we protest now, how are we documenting what's happening now um, so that we don't forget it? I know one of the things you always hear on Twitter is people say, um, uh, historians will look back on this, but historians are traditionally not telling the stories of brown and black communities and we need to be the historians of our own communities. So, um, so how do we make radical art for radical times for our people? So these are some of the projects that I've worked on. Um, I'm, I'm highlighting them because uh, we we're talking about objects and archives and I thought it would be interesting to share and hopefully it can help inspire some people. And I've, I've been in a lot of anthologies. The book on the left is called Love and Shala, The Secret Love Lives of American Muslim Women that came out in 2011. And that book was really one of the first anthologies out there about uh, Muslim American women telling their own stories in their own way. Um, and that really shaped my life as a writer in many ways. Um, this, this project came from the, the sign in the top right corner, the no moon star uh, could be a hate crime against the universe or it could be a hate crime against Muslims. These signs were over the 101 for a few, for a couple of years. So uh, me and my friends would always go and take down the signs. So I took down the signs and the, I turned them into art, which is what the um, bottom image is. Um, I was also involved in this art show, uh, Activist Art from South Asian California. Um, the image up the flag image is mine. Um, and in that image, I use um, voter registration forms to make the Paisleys. Um, and this was really great to be a part of this group show with other South Asians um, really trying to figure out how do we tell, how do we tell the stories of our community, not just stories, how do we tell the histories of our community and activist history through art? This was a fun project. There was a I mean, also a sad project. There was the guy who got kicked off of a plane for um, saying the word inshallah. Um, so inshallah means God willing. So uh, I, I did a group poetry project um, where 17 poets uh, contributed verses on a Google doc um, and we turned it into a poem. We printed it up and then we snuck it onto airplane magazines. And that was our form of uh, rebellion. I've also been a part of zines. This is a totally radical Muslim zine project that came out of a collective in um, the Bay Area. Uh, this is the biggest project I've been a part of. It was an independent podcast, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim. We were around for five years. Uh, we, picture on the right, we recorded at the White House, which is really exciting. Um, and we were one of the few we recorded the Obama White House to clarify. Uh, it was one of the, I think only a couple of podcasts were ever able to actually get into the White House. Um, and in this in this conversation, it was me and my friends are Nurbash, and we just talked about being American Muslim women. And we just were telling our own stories and that in itself was a radical political act for many people. And that just kind of shows how marginalized our communities are. And then this is like my most recent project I did with the Center for Cultural Power where I wrote a poem and then they put it to animation about um, um, uh, the fingerprinting and how fingerprinting's origin came actually from Kolkata when the white colonizer went to Kolkata uh, and couldn't tell brown people apart. So they invented fingerprinting and now we use fingerprinting when it comes to voting. Um, this is my my project from this past summer, Aunties with Deadly Stairs. This was um, inspired by two uh, Muslim women that were kicked off of an airplane for staring too hard. And so in this project, I've been using paper ephemera of um, uh, of, of transportation. So a lot of these image uh, paper and collage in the background are TSA. Um, TSA notes that were gifted to me by TSA in my luggages. So I reclaimed them into my art. And finally, um, these are Yuri Kotiyama. I know we, we invoked her earlier into the space. Um, these were uh, protest signs that we made 
um, for the Women's March in 2017. And um, then we got contacted by the Smithsonian National Museum of American History that they wanted our poster to be in their collection, which was so stunning and amazing. And um, just to know that with all of the work that I've done and all this, um, all this art that's been out there to know that something is, of mine is now in the National Museum of American History is really amazing. And I, I don't know, it's cool. So that is me. And I will pass it on to um, writer and author Gina Apostle. Thank you so much everyone um, for having me. Um, I will be reading from a section of my novel Insurrecto, which is set during the Philippine American War. And there are some violent images here. Magsalin shakes out prints of Samar in 1901. Index card sized pictures against yellowed boards, pictures of banana groves, dead bodies in gray trenches, white soldiers in battle dress fatigues gazing down as if in regret at a charred battleground. Each of the pictures is doubled. Each card is a set of thick twin prints, the prints pasted side by side on stiff panels. All are roughly postcard size. They are late 19th century stereo cards. You look closely at the twin pictures as if presented with one of those optical illusions that should come with the caption, find what's missing, but there is nothing missing to find. The two pictures on each stereo card are identical, only a slight time lapse, undetectable indicates difference. Difference produces perspective. On the Library of Congress website, www.loc.gov, search, quote, Philippine insurrection, and you come across them, archived stereo pairs from the years 1899 to 1913, the bleak years of US imperial aggression before the surrender of the last Filipino forces to American occupation, a war called by Americans, the Spanish-American War to Filipinos, it's the War of Independence. She looks at the serial cards, a history in ellipses too obscure to know, not to mention the words in quotes and not. Insurgents are in quotes, insurrection is not. Rebel is a problematic term. History is not fully annotated or adequately contemplated in online archives. The puzzling du duplication becomes mere trope, a cliche. Photographic captions rebuke lo losers and winners alike. Soldiers, for instance, refer only to white males. Wounded does not suggest who has done the wounding. Magsalin looks with impatience at the familiar photos of Manchiara Brazi, the filmmaker's papers falling from the manila envelope. The pictures of the dead Filipino bodies and the burned Filipino towns are remarkably precise, but they are hard to see. The passivity of a photographic record might be relieved only by the viewer the photographs produce. And even then, not all types of viewers are ideal. Photographs of a captured country shot through the lens of the captor possess layers of ambiguity too confusing to grasp. There is the eye of the victim, the captured, stilled and muted and hallowed in mud and time. There is the eye of the victim, the captured, who may be bystander, belligerent, blameless, blamed. Though so there are subtle shifts in pathetic balance, who is to measure them? There is the eye of the colonized, viewing their captured history in the distance created by time. There is the eye of the captive, the soldier, who has just wounded the captured. There is the eye of the captive, the colonizer, who has captured history's lens. There is the eye of the citizens, bystander, belligerent, blameless, blamed, whose history has colonized the captured in the distance created by time. And there is the eye of the actual photographer, the one who captured the captured and the captors in her camera's lens. What the hell was she thinking? So I'm going to show you the stereoscope. This is a stereoscope. 
and it contains, I can't see, so I'm gonna move this a little bit. This is a stereo card. And what you do with a stereoscope is you, you're very close to the card and it becomes like a view master. It's 3D and you push it until it becomes that 3D picture. It's very intimate. It's a weird thing to have this as your entertainment. This was late Victorian era entertainment. Usually you'd find Eiffel, uh, you know, Eiffel Tower, the Nile, you know, um, I saw, I, I have a lot of these stereo cards and you can buy them in bunches on eBay. And along with the uh, pictures of Versailles or, or, or um, Golden Gate Bridge, you'll find dead Filipino bodies. Um, I discovered them when I had to do research for, uh, the, for this encyclopedia on Philippine history. And I found them, copies of them at the Library of Congress and in, fold, in folders called Philippine insurrection. So the, the, the pictures, the photocopies are mislabeled, history. The, the, libra the librarian, librarians of Congress mislabel the folders calling it Philippine insurrection. I did tell the librarians, <laughs> change the names on those, those folders, but I understand from scholars that that remains the name on the folder. Filipinos consider this their war of independence. And I will say this um, about this history. Um, I ended up buying many of these cards on eBay. And I'll show you a bunch of them that I have, a bunch of these cards. Um, and so these are objects that are part of my history. And if you notice, they are stories of multiple histories, the Philippines, the American, the Philippine American, the Asian American, the Asian. And of course, it's an important piece of world history. And it's important for me to recognize that um, I didn't know about this history growing up in the Philippines. I came to America as a grad student and stayed with, um, to uh, bring up a family um, when I married here. But in the Philippines, you don't study the Philippine-American War. You study the, the, the revolution, I, it turns out, is the war against Spain. And, um, and, and so, as a novelist, what I was trying to figure out was why is this not studied in the Philippines? And obviously it's invisible in America. It's really just a small part of the Spanish-American War that people look at. But um, so I wrote a novel called Insurrecto about this technology, which moved into the technology of filmmaking and it moved into how colonialism is so um, linked to these technologies and a story. And, I, and, and so this novel is a story about this war. Um, these are images of suffering and trauma, but if one looked correctly, if one adjusted one's image as you do with this machine, if you, if you adjusted with truth in mind, the art produced by knowledge of this trauma is liberatory. Our job as storytellers is to find the vision the story that liberates us, the perspective, not of our damage, but of our desire, the desire for sovereignty over our bodies and to speak our sense of self as we saw fit. So that is what I did in my novel. Thank you very much. I'll answer any questions because I think I've run out of time. I wrote about women, all women in that novel. Hong An, um, please um, uh, welcome Hong An. Thank you so much, Gina. Wow, that was powerful. Um, I love, I'm still thinking about this phrase that you just said, difference produces perspective. Um, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to everyone who brought us here together and worked hard to make this event happen. Um, I'm honored to be in conversation with you all. And I just want to acknowledge that I'm speaking from Durham, North Carolina and from the stolen indigenous lands of the um, Shikori, Lumbee and Eno peoples. My work as an artist is based on the idea that political battles are ideological and aesthetic. I have understood this implicitly since I was young when I saw old magazine war images of Vietnamese people being killed and experienced a kind of disembodiment, a shock of recognition, a paradox I could not reconcile. I am to be killed, but I'm also to be saved. 
My work in photography, video, and sound is invested in tearing apart the scenes and totalizing na national narratives. By first pointing out the violent contradictions that those narratives hold, secondly, by insisting on a transnational framework that links experiences and subjectivities that are connected by capitalist and imperialist war, and thirdly, by interrogating the media tools and conventions of looking and hearing. My work asks how and by whom does the Vietnamese body, the refugee body, the Asian female body become legible when recording devices, um, as Gina just beautifully articulated, are historically an instrument of colonial aggression and violence. In cultural narratives, these questions play out through the hypervisibility of certain bodies and the erasure of others, stories that are in the service of maintaining narratives that undergird and reify racial capitalist order which siphons life from Black and POC people while colonizing indigenous lands and brutalizing workers. And this order is in many ways a battle over the images of bodies and a control of the narratives that those bodies contain. A project I did with my collaborator, Hong Mo, the opposite of looking is not invisibility, the opposite of yellow is not gold, takes up vernacular images from our family archives and juxtaposes them with congressional documents to point out how the US frames humanitarian causes in racial, cultural, and economic terms, a project cast in stark relief to virulent anti-immigrant policies and anti-refugee sentiment. This juxtaposition forces the viewer to confront these vernacular images of Vietnamese people and contend with their own misrecognition of these bodies as white supremacist ideologies that have always undergirded our society are violently erupting in everyday life, there is a need to assert these kinds of images, to claim them as part of a diasporic narrative in the face of the cancerous myths of Native American nativism, but also to simultaneously point out its untenable entanglements. These are photographs of my mother and my collaborator's mother, and those are all the pictures that are um, in the, these photographs that are rephotographed. So to put, but to also simultaneously point out its untenable entanglements that the claim to belonging in the national narrative means being complicit with American imperialism. This work resists that impulse to belong. Um, so I wanna show a short one minute uh, or less a clip of a sound installation. This is what it looks like and we'll see a video where I just took so you can hear it live. The speakers are active in the installation. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause share and skip over to the video. So this piece is a kind of decolonial meditation on the history of French and American violence in Vietnam, suggesting the traces of colonial power through the residue of sonic history. Tangled electrical wires are ubiquitous on the streets of Vietnam and public loudspeakers were installed during its resistance war with France in the 1950s. They were used for French propaganda and later used by the US military. The soundtrack blasting through the loudspeakers include musical sounds, a song by French Legion soldiers, Vietnamese Catholic chanting and an American pop song popular in Vietnam during the war. Um, so I'm gonna end with just a brief, a brief um, mention of this project called Treatment for a Year of the Rabbit, which uses sound, video and photography to visually deconstruct cinema in relationship to the experience and memory of the American war in Vietnam. So there's a few videos in here and then also these photographs are video stills from um, archival videos, photographs that were made from video stills of archival videos taken by soldiers 
American and Australian soldiers that were taken during rest and relaxation. So they were just like moments where they were filming the landscape and would kind of catch um, like a female figure walking by and then would follow it for like literally a second or two before it locked, you know, they would lose it. So I made stills from these moments where they were these sort of really voyeuristic moments. Um, so the project is about deconstructing kind of cinema, the ways that we tell stories and in relationship to the memory of the war in Vietnam to really think about how we tell stories and also how can we tell stories with what we have left of what those stories are. And it was kind of, in a way, a kind of searching for my mother's story. All of this footage was taken before 1975, which would have been when my mother would have been in Vietnam and walking around the streets of Saigon during that time. So um, I'm gonna show just a quick video um, clip from this piece in the show, which is called, um, I have been to the place where you left your family. And the video is very simple. It's an animated photograph that I took the first time I went back to Vietnam of my aunt who was reading a letter from my mother who she hasn't seen. They've never remet. like my mom's never been back to Vietnam. So in the photograph, she's reading the letter that my mom you know, um, gave to me to deliver to my, to my aunt. So let me try to get to that video and we'll just, I'll end with this. And I will just end there since I'm out of time, time, but looking forward to being in conversation and I will pass it back to Jian. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to all of you. I uh, thank you, Taz, Gina, hung on um, for those really inspiring and moving presentations. I've been told that uh, we have a little bit more time for our discussion um, until I, about uh, 2 10. Um, we'll just have a slightly shorter break. And so I, I don't want us to feel rushed um, to the discussion portion. Um, I just wanted to start actually with something um, really striking that, that Gina said, um, which is that, that we need to find um, the perspective that liberates us. And I was thinking that in each of your presentations, you shared with us um, an object or, or objects um, that were quite you know, hostile and violent, right? Whether it is like the no, the no sign with the moon and the star, and you know we can interpret it very generously, or, or, or um, most likely as it was intended, um, or those the stereo cards um, that Gina shared with us, or hold on, um, those images that the first images they showed us uh, from the war, and it, it, the idea of finding perspective, finding perspective that liberates us, suggests that that there's a way of looking at these you know incredibly violent images and objects. Um, there's a way to look at them that, that is liberating. And I feel like all of your art attempts to do that. But I was wondering if you could each talk a little bit about that process, right? What are the challenges of confronting these objects? Um, how do you work through them to get to a point that feels a little bit more like liberation? Um, and so uh, Gina, if you don't mind, we'll start with you and then I'll sort of move down, um, hold on and, and Taz. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And it was, it's, it was really central to the writing of the novel. Um, because a lot of the work that I, a lot of the research that I did was really research on trauma. What I found was that the voices of the Filipinos were really invisible, were really unheard. They weren't documented at all, but the voices of the soldiers, the voices of the colonizers, the Senate hearings, there were really long Senate hearings on the Philippines, on the occupation of the Philippines in 1900 through, you know, through 1946 when the Philippines, well, uh, was so-called uh, free, became a republic. 
But so one thing is one structure of reading that I do is, a, is really an inverse structure. You read how they read the Filipino and I invert it. You know, I just read the, the truth is going to be a form of inversion of whatever that of the white supremacist has said, because the, the view of the white supremacist is so distorted. It's so distorted in terms of the Filipino and it's so obvious um, in almost all these places. So one of the analytic moves that I'm always doing as a writer is inversion. And if the, so, so that's what I can talk about that a little bit more, but reading, reading from the lens of the colonizer means you have to invert that concept of the Filipino as lazy or whatever it is that they talk about the Filipino and recognize um, the acts of resistance and the resistance in being lazy, you know, or the or the ways in which um, you uh, you read read humor, for instance, in the ways Filipinos uh, tackle um, the this history. So I'm going to be honest. Even though my novel was about trauma, it's uh, it was a comic novel. Uh, Owen, oh, yes. Um, yeah, excellent question. I think for me, um, I draw a lot on sort of thinking about um, Ariella Azule's work um, and her her writing on decolonizing photography and the idea of kind of really interrogating that moment of, um, of contact, the moment of, um, of the photographer being, you know, photographing the subject, that exchange and thinking about that exchange not being just like a one-way street, right? Um, and for me, it's always about trying to call attention to the viewer's relationship to what they're seeing, right? Trying to call attention to the subject position and make that person, make the viewer try to um, like recognize, have a recognition of their own position as they're viewing it. Um, and I think I do, you know, I think I try to do this through a kind of stilling of the image oftentimes, you know, it's my, it's my impulse to kind of still the video to be like, wait, look here, like, what was this exchange? What happened? Like, this wasn't just a passing moment. How do we rest this moment from the kind of, you know, um, the, the graveyard of historical material and interrogate just that little moment, right? And so there's a kind of um, yeah, kind of liberation of that moment so that there's an openness to really having um, having a more radical relationship to what you're seeing. And to me, it really is about um, changing and uh, changing and really like shifting and radicalizing the way that we've been, you know, um, acculturated and, um, and um, indoctrinated to look that our looking is not without its ideological you know, the machinery of ideological, um, you know, um, of, um, culture like has, has, a, has, has, has trained us to look in certain ways. So I think for me, it really is about trying to like make those moments really still and to reinterrogate them by, you know, there's juxtaposition, but also the stilling and things, you know, images in relationship to other things like sound or text, um, things like that. Um, I think for me, I, you know, I, I was 21 when September 11th happened. So my adult life has been really framed by this Islamophobia framework. Um, just this constant, whether it's like September 11th racial profiling backlash or all the way up to what we've been seeing um, uh, pre-Trump getting elected to now. And I think there's like, there's a way that we've seen been seeing activism happening where there's this kind of idea of like, we need to humanize ourselves. Like we Muslims need to humanize ourselves and uh, be a part of dinner table conversation so people can see that we're human, which I'm very anti that because I don't think that we need to be doing things to humanize ourselves because we are human. But I mean, that was like a frame of thinking that was happening. Um, and then there's also like the, like, making disrupting, being a rebel, being pushing back on like what the mainstream narrative is saying that uh, they need to um, 
be thinking of Muslim Americans and Muslim American artwork. And I think that's kind of, uh, I, I didn't share some of that artwork, but I do have art where I'm, I feel like uh, my Muslim Valentine's Day cards where I'm, where I'm intentionally making people feel uncomfortable for them to uh, self critique um, and doing it in humorous ways. And I think for me, I mean, like what you were asking, like these objects, like that, that sign on the freeway, that was a very violent sign just to like drive under that every day and seeing that still up there and that no one else had taken it down. And then like, we had to have this like secret underground network of trying to figure out how to take that down. Like that's, that's traumatic, that's trauma. Um, but I think that like, like we, like we have, we have to do it. We have to take down the signs. Um, turning into the art is like, I guess, was just me, my way of like healing that or um, trying to turn it on its head and to turn something else into it. But um, I don't know, I've, like, like so much of like what it means to be Muslim American as an activist and an artist for the past two decades has been a little bit of trauma porn. A lot of like, you know, sharing our, um, the violence that we've experienced, the hate crimes that we've experienced. Um, and um, I think I think that's, there's a place for that, but we also need to share our stories and we need to share, like build community. And we also need to find joy with each other to move forward. And I think that's kind of the, 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 the rope that we've been like walking on, just trying to find that balance. Um, Taz, that actually leads directly into my second question, which was, you know, the, the risk, I mean, on the one hand, there's this incredible urgency to uh, grapple with, you know, these images and representations that are so burdensome, right? That, that are violent and burdensome and that affect and, and shape the way that, that um, people can, can talk, think and talk about their lives, right? Or even go about their lives. Um, on the other hand, there is the danger of um, sort of reducing like the story, this, the possible number of stories that we can tell to that kind of confrontation, right? With, with that kind of violence. Um, and so I was wondering, and, and I think in each of um, the works that you presented, you can kind of see a hint of that kind of that other aspect, right? Of the kind of the love or the celebration, um, what can't be just kind of, what isn't just trauma, right? Like kind of seeping out. Um, and so I was curious to hear actually each of you talk a little bit about, about that balancing act, right? On the one hand, the, like the kind of urgency you feel, um, right, uh, to, to be somebody who, who uh, you know, engages and invites and, and, and makes change. And on the other hand, um, you know, I think the equally important need to make sure that visibility or telling one's story is not ever reduced to that in, in itself, right? That there's a kind of um, another level of and different affects, right? That they can come out. Um, and so let's see, um, Holland, would you mind starting us off in this instance? <laughs> Sure. I mean, I'm still thinking about it because I feel like for Vietnamese people, um, like, I don't know. I mean, for me, it's just like, like, I just grew up with like a, our, the culture in my family. And I think probably many Vietnamese families feel this way. Like there's just such an intense uh, focus on sorrow, like Jibu and like sad all the time. Like there's an intense, there's a, an intense focus on that in terms of like, I feel like it's really built into the way that we understand ourselves and our history. Um, and so I, I think that, yes, you know, in terms of that balance of like what it is to deal, like for, so for me, it's more about like, how do we like understand the trauma as it's um, kind of wound up and sort of in, in, in inseparable, inextricable from our daily lives, right? So for me, it's not necessarily about this sort of like opposite balance, but more about just sort of like, how does it, how does it actually manifest all the time? And it's not like we're just crying all the time, you know what I mean? So I think that there's, for me, it's more about just like, there's a really, I think for me, it's really important that we're addressing these, that we talk through these things because it's also in Vietnamese families, like, you know, it's very, very difficult to talk about these things. And I'll, I'll say there's this really amazing short documentary by Carol Nguyen called No Crying at the Dinner Table that I'll plug. I don't know her, but she's really amazing. It's a wonderful short documentary that's on Vimeo right now. Um, and it kind of addresses this. Um, 
this very question of just like the working through of trauma for individual families. So, um, so again, I think for me, it is like that process is powerful and that's a, that's also meaningful. And I think it is also joyful for me too, you know, like, um, it's transformative, you know, um, like when I started making work and, you know, I didn't want to show it to my family, but slowly I did start to share it with my family, with my parents and, you know, it, it's really hard, but I feel like it did slowly transform their understanding of me and um, opened us up to different kinds of conversations. So I think that, and that's joyful, you know, ultimately it, it changes the fabric of who we are when we kind of can accept and understand and work through these questions in a way that, it, that understands that these things don't end, these wars never end, you know, um, the residue of this violence doesn't end even after generations, so. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, Taz and then Gina to, to close us. I, I mean, it, it's such a complicated question. Um, I think the thing that I'm, I was thinking about uh, was le- the podcast, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim is, was, I mean, we're not, we're not recording anymore, but it was considered a comedy podcast. And we went into it uh, being like a conversational political podcast. And I think um, like we, we were recentering our conversation like two different Muslim women from very different backgrounds and diff- very different pers- perspectives, telling our unique stories and just like what it means to be Muslim American. We would have like segments like uh, creeping Sharia and um, like awkward ask a Muslim. And it was just like, it was just like us talking, but that in itself was just so political depending on who was listening or it was so funny depending on who was listening. And that's the contradiction of our title, good Muslim, bad Muslim, like the framing of who thought we were good and who thought we were bad um, was just kind of applied to us. And I think that's kind of, that. I mean, like that's kind of how I address trauma, I guess. Like, like it can't be something separate and it can't be like, uh, we can't, like it, it has to be like, in the recentering of yourself, you're going to incorporate all these things of your of yourself. In the recentering of your community, in the recentering of your community's stories, um, you're going to bring all these aspects to yourself, and that in itself is the political act. I think that's kind of what I was thinking about when you were asking that. Thank you so much. I think we have another uh, minute, uh, Gina. If you have some last thoughts. My, my thoughts are really just connected to what they said and the fact that um, I, I thought it was very interesting that, that you're talking about Vietnamese and sorrow, whereas I have to deal with Filipinos and puns and humor. You know, we have a, there's a diner that's called, that has uh, menus right now of, um, uh, under the Duterte regime of Tinorchern a pork chop, you know, tortured pork chop. And so they're using a uh, language in this way that recognizes trauma, um, using it in some way that also resists trauma, that also um, falls into um, trauma. And I think um, being able to recognize how um, our lens is powerful and multiple always is really for me um, uh, a part of the work that I do and to, and to just do it. You know, my novels are, have multiple perspectives, move into multiple storytellings. And um, I just do the work that I feel needs to be done given the history I have. And that risk taking and boldness, I think is part of that huge pleasure that we, we do take as artists. And we hope that, that readers too gain from that. Um, thank you all so much um, for, for your uh, incredible presentations and also this conversation, which I hope we'll be able to continue with the audience during the Q&A. Um, but that concludes our first panel today. Many thanks to Taz, Gina, Holan um, for this discussion. And so now we're going to have a brief break. The webinar will remain open, so you'll see a holding slide on your screen. Um, and so you don't need to sign out or leave. Um, and then we will resume at uh, 2.15 promptly. Thank you all.